Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Jason Buffington with Veeam, and um, I am so pleased to actually have our guest for this week, Christoph Bertrand from the Enterprise Strategy Group, someplace I used to walk the halls of myself many, many years ago. Christoph, thank you for joining the program. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, by the way, when we say wherever you're from, we actually want to know. So um, I've checked in on behalf of the great state of Texas. I know you're coming from uh, Marin County, California, right? Um, so let's take a look at that map. And please uh, do pile on on the LinkedIn thread and tell us where are you from? Looks like you've got some Eastern Europe already in the house, a bit of Georgia going on. So uh, so we really want to light up the whole world green. Um, and that's, uh, well, Veeam Green too, but that's for a different conversation. So let's uh, uh, let's get into it. So first and foremost, um, whenever we bring analysts in, it's always because we want to learn about the data that you're bringing to market. Um, ESG or excuse me, Veeam actually did a survey earlier this year, way earlier, um, pre-COVID, um, around data protection trends and what's going on there. So uh, uh, there should be a QR code that'll pop up at least once. Um, make sure to, to join that report. But you've actually done some similar research around uh, what we call it real world SLAs um, and methods. So so tell us about that project. And then um, I got a, an early look at it. Let's get nerdy on some of that data. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, as you know, we, we conduct quite a bit of research at, at ESG uh, and it really spans a number of themes as well as practices. In, in my in my case, I'm focused on data protection and compliance. And most recently, I actually uh, uh, updated uh, great research that I believe you did a few years ago on real world SLAs to understand what is the sentiment in general terms, where are people, what technologies are they using, what metrics are they getting, and what's really going on. Because at the end of the day, we're doing this for a reason, which is to recover, right? Yep. yep. Or, to, or to not fail. And I think there is a lot more that meets the eye and having objectives is great, but getting to actuals is really what you're doing, trying to do, so. Absolutely. Well, hopefully my old work didn't hold you back too much. Um, I was uh, so pleased to see how this project um, came together for y'all. One of the big areas that I think a lot of folks are really talking about, um, even before COVID, even before some of the other the riots and all the other things that are creating chaos for so many organizations today is disaster recovery is really evolving um, as a mindset and as a set of architectures and capabilities. Can you tell us, you know, from your perspective on ESG, where is DR headed? So really DR, DR is headed to the cloud. Uh, there is a lot of evidence uh, based on our research. And of course, uh, anecdotally as well, you know, that cloud and DR are becoming very synonymous, uh, which of course was not a given a few years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've, uh, I remember being literally walked out of the room when I mentioned cloud into uh, a briefing once to a financial institution, but that was a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Now certainly DR is recombined with cloud technologies in multiple ways. You can go to the cloud, uh, you can uh, you know, leverage infrastructure service, or you can leverage a, a full backup and recovery or disaster recovery service. And here we have some, some data from uh, uh, you know, a recent research. And as you can see, a uh, vast majority of organizations use uh, a cloud as a, uh, a disaster recovery capability. And what you see on the slide to be uh, for our viewers is what is in the uh, dark blue is the primary choice that people actually mentioned when we asked them about their sort of secondary site strategy. Uh, so pick one and then pick all that apply in the light blue. And of course, what we also see is that organizations will uh, use a variety of technologies. So I love this data. We can actually leave the data up, but one of the things I love about this particular chart, this one really caught my eye, that top data point, 56% of organizations say that they'll use a cloud-based DR service as at least part of, as at least one of their methods, right? For 40% right. of their primary, but over half of organizations think the cloud is gonna be part of their DR strategy. I think that's really, really exciting news. I think it's not only exciting news, but I think also what it does, it now creates another conversation uh, or a set of conversations, which is, well, now that I have my data in cloud, how am I really protecting that data? Is it protected in the cloud to the cloud? Is it on-premise to the cloud? Is it from cloud to cloud? And do I have coherence uh, across the board in terms of our POs and our TOs? So I think sure. there's a lot more that meets the eye, but it is definitely a fantastic uh, set of technologies to uh, fully enable disaster recovery, something we didn't have a few years ago. 
No, and I, and I I think so for I mean when when you and I used to collaborate many years ago, one of the things we used to talk about was the demise of that cold site center, right? You know the uh, the the com discos, and I can use that name because they're not around anymore. But the other companies were like that, and certainly the idea of do I really want to have to manage secondary infrastructure just in case is becoming less and less appealing. Before we kind of double click into what that looks like, though, um, definitely want to go back to the map. Um, for a second and see uh, see how things are going. Uh, all right, uh, Latam, you can always count on being in the house. So uh, Canada going on and India's in the house. Anyone else? Oh, uh, I see a couple countries in Europe. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, so let's, uh, um, please keep those coming in. Please keep uh, uh, chiming in on where you're coming from and we might give a couple shout outs in particular along the way. Um, so you've got a second data point around what, what, if you, if you talk about the cloud as part of DR, one of the things that's always been interesting to me is it's easy to just get your data up into a cloud, right? That's, that's not that hard. It's hard to do it well. And so Veeam's pretty proud of how we do that, but it's not hard just to get your data out of the building. What's hard is to fail over into a cloud, right? And I know that Draz is something that, um, is near and dear to your heart. Can we unpack that a little bit? Sure. I think there are, first of all, multiple topologies. Uh, to your point, yeah, you're going to put data in the cloud. Maybe you're going to run a production application in the cloud. Actually, that's pretty much becoming the majority now mm -hmm. for many organizations. And of course, there are variations depending on the age of the organization. The other question is, well, now you have production data. You've got to back it up. I think a, 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 wise, a wise man uh, once said you have to follow production or back up follows production data. It may have been you. Uh, <laughs> But in, in, so so now what we have this data in the cloud, we've got to protect it. There's just uh, mm -hmm. no um, no question. And what we've seen is that a conflation at times, um, you know, in terms of availability versus responsibility for backup. Yep. Because the service is up and running, or because your your uh, hyper your your hyperscaler is up and running, doesn't mean your data is being backed up or protected. You're in charge. Yep. Now for BCDR, what we see is multiple interpretations of how you can then leverage that service, if you will. And what we see on on, on the recent research is that uh, as a primary choice, um, you know, about a third will use infrastructure as a service. So that's AWS and Google, etc. Right. The, big hyperscalers. And it's kind of self-managed, meaning you are very much like you would manage your production applications, you are managing your BCDR with your uh, hyperscaler. And that's uh, and a lot of organizations like this because they have control, a lot of control. But at the same time, you think about the point you were mentioning earlier, oh, well, it wouldn't be nice if we had more automation, more ability to fail over, making things happen a little maybe more easily and more reliably. That's why a lot of services now exist, of course. Yep. And here, I'm not going to be uh, really academic about what's backup as a service versus that's recovery as a service, uh, whether it's self-managed or not. The point being is that 68% want uh, the service approach. In other words, here's my data. Uh, let me log on to a service to manage it and get my recovery, uh, or you manage the recovery, et cetera. That's significant, significant, because you can see how the world is starting to, to now sort of shape up in terms of cloud BCDR. Yeah, and when you talk about people want a service, I can imagine there's there's two there's two kinds of ways that um, that folks at home could hear the word service, right? They could be hearing it as I want a subscription consumption model, meaning I just want to pay for it as I go. I don't want to maintain my own infrastructure, that kind of thing. And then there are other people that are saying I just want my data out of the building. I'll figure out the the elegance of recovery later, but I just want my data out of the building. And that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, on your chart here, right? Is is that at a minimum, I wanna get my data out of the building. Almost all of those are almost unilaterally exclusively consumed as a subscription model, but get your data out of the building first and foremost, and then we'll figure it out. Is that a fair way to pull that in? Well, I think, yeah, especially we looking at the two, uh, two uh, slides that we looked at, absolutely, there's definitely more of an interest in getting some of that data out of the, the actual building for all sorts of reasons. And of course, cost and uh, you know manageability, et cetera, come into play. But I will also say, uh, and that's really more, maybe more uh, a discussion here we can get into, while cloud is great and disaster recovery as a service is great and having those capabilities is important. At the end of the day, a good first line of defense on-prem is not a bad thing either. 
Uh, yeah. I think it depends on your topology, depends on how much data, how much operational recovery you think you're going to need to uh, conduct. Uh, so like everything else, it's a hybrid world. And I think there's always more that meets the eye. And depending on the topology, you're going to have to adopt a, a blended approach. And that's also where having a great service partner can help. Sure. Uh, because many organizations don't really know how to do it. Yeah, so expertise is something that I wish we could spend almost an entire call on because I think that's one of the big things that really is the hallmark between most just get your data out of the building, that's lovely, um, versus actually having the expertise to be successful in DR is a whole other conversation. Now, one of the things, and, and you and I have had a lot of conversations around it depends, right, uh, kind of scenarios, but one of them that I know you're passionate on is ransomware preparedness, right? You know, for, for the two and a half, three decades that you and I have been doing this in different circles. Um, uh, in fact, I think our, our first foray was CA-ish um, uh, many years ago, but you used to always talk about DR as having that most recent copy. How current is the copy that that is off-prem? When you talk about ransomware, that's exactly the wrong copy um, that you want to have, isn't it? Can you talk about what you're seeing from a ransomware preparedness perspective? Yeah, I mean, you make a very good point. It's almost, uh, uh, you know, unnatural when you think about it because it's garbage garbage out in many ways, yeah. what you're going to replicate or copy if it's, uh, you know, uh, a, a bad executable that will not go away. So what we're seeing is really an evolution. I think there's this creation of almost a new uh, set of technologies or methodologies around cyber resilience. And what that is, is really uh, combining disaster recovery, business continuity with cyber recovery and really prevention and mitigation. Uh, and you will have heard, I'm sure, of terms like air gapping and sure. uh, how to segregate networks and how to really protect uh, the data and more importantly, uh, testing. So one of the things you want to do, you can pretty much try everything and mitigate and train people and mitigate the uh, intrusions, etc. Uh, in reality, something is very likely to happen and hit you. The question is not that, not what you, uh, you know, do to try to prevent it is if it happened, what do you do? Uh, yep. so there's an incident response type of technology there uh, that's needed and methodology, but also how do you get back on your feet? And invariably to get back on your feet, you're going to go back to a good, last good known copy and that's sure. backup and or replication. And that's where if you can combine all of that uh, in a workflow, it's not unlike a disaster recovery workflow. It's a twist on what already exists. Sure. Uh, and I love the idea of uh, sandboxing, which is, you know, you, regularly actually traverse uh, your critical applications or data sets to make sure that nothing funny is in there and you know, some execution path, et cetera. So lots of techniques that can be used. You know, if um, uh, on the topic of sandboxing and, and uh, typically we leave the, the Veeam speak for towards the end, but um, uh, my colleague, Melissa Palmer, who is the, the queen of Veeam Availability Orchestrator and all the workflows and sandboxing and data labs happens in that, um, had the chance to do a full hour of DR best practices with her. Make sure to go to the Veeam website um, if you want to find out more about how Veeam does data labbing along the way. Um, so, okay, so we've covered ransomware preparedness, we've covered immutability, right? That's kind of one of those key factors along the way. I almost want to kind of visit back to what are the other data points that you wanted to share uh, for some of the things that you've been seeing um, in your last set of research? Well, so uh, I think we have a slide on, on the impact of uh, COVID-19, a couple of slides All on right. that. And one of them is on uh, actually on the fact that obviously with COVID-19, there's more ransomware. Uh, but there's all, there are also more challenges. Uh, so uh, certainly we have some data on that. And what we've seen is an acceleration of uh, ransomware uh, due to uh, COVID-19, more attacks. Uh, I believe one in seven uh, reported significantly more. Uh, so yeah, that's the one. So you can see the story um, is pretty much half of the people we talked to. And that's really in the uh, recent uh, weeks uh, have seen quite a bit of uh, additional activity. And it makes sense simply because you have more people now uh, working from, from home. You may not have the same discipline in terms of VPNs, et cetera. There may be more temptation to go click on links, uh, et cetera. So uh, there is a direct impact of the health crisis on IT for sure. Uh, and there is a direct impact on the ability to uh, protect data or the need to better recover specifically in the context of ransomware. I think these are very important points that everyone should be aware of. 
All right, that's that's really scary. Before we actually dig into more on that attack surface, because this is something you and I had a conversation around not that long ago, can we look at the map one more time? Because it looks like we've been getting um, a pretty big bubble coming up. So uh, we got Denmark, uh, uh, Georgia, the state, uh, not the country, uh, Dubai, Pennsylvania, um, South Africa, um, easily some of the best uh, uh, um, uh, barbecue and steak I've ever had, and a very good bottle of wine at a cheap price. Um, can always be had in South Africa. So if I can get back there, that's that's a plan. Uh, Ukraine and Peru are in the house. Um, Iran almost always joins um, these calls, which I just think is fantastic. Uh, France, Pakistan, Germany, and of course, Wisconsin. Not quite as cool as Germany, but um, but we're going to let Wisconsin join too. So um, yeah, so please keep piling those in. By the way, I'm no dig on Wisconsin. I spent a couple of years in Racine. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what you said on that last slide. When you and I had a chance to talk about this earlier, we talked around, there was kind of two sets of organizations coming into the COVID quarantine. There were those that already had a cloudy plan and they just accelerated. And there were those who didn't have a cloudy plan yet. Um, and all of a sudden their attack surface just exponentially increased. Can you talk about that as it relates then back to back to your data from uh, from ransomware and Jeopardy? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I think you, you think about what happened, right? All of a sudden you have to have all of your workers out of the office by and large, mm -hmm. right? And working from home. So either you were remote ready and that's really one of the, you know, and, and when I say remote ready, that means you had a bunch of capabilities and technologies in place. Uh, not only did the workers have their own devices or devices you provided them with, you have VPNs, you have great backup and recovery in place, you have all the networking figured out. Uh, and of course, uh, you are ready to just have people work from wherever they want. Now, if you're not, uh, and, and that leverages also, by the way, a ton of cloud-based applications and cloud-based resources, right? So that's really the model. If you're remote ready, well, COVID hits, it's uh, it's not business as usual, but it's not that far away from business as usual because you're ready for it. For those who are not ready, it was a totally different experience. Sure. And that's where things started to go wrong and go south because candidly, now you may not have the ability to support people in a way that is efficient, uh, that provides them the ability to be uh, more productive. And more importantly, you've dramatically ex uh, increased your exposure to attacks uh, and you may not be getting the performance you need out of your system. So it, it becomes an interesting wave, if you will, that somehow the remote, remote readiness or that flexibility has become an advantage. Uh, uh, that's not something that anybody could have necessarily foreseen mm -hmm. uh, because a lot could be said about having people collaborating in an office. So, sure. so, so I think it's a very interesting twist, but more importantly, a big impact on, on uh, IT spending, uh, on on BCDR, not a bad thing for BCDR. Actually, we're seeing more spend uh, happening on BCDR, so it's 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 kind of a good thing, but it's a necessary uh, investment as well. Yeah, I forget what politician said it, but they said something like, "Never let a, a good crisis go to waste." And certainly, <laughs> whenever we have a, a crisis, whether it's whether it's the fires in your neck of the woods right. or you know a hurricane season on the East Coast. Um, as we come into the as we come into winter, we can expect the Northeast to have some some snow based power outages. There's almost almost always a crisis, and it forces everyone to reconsider. You know how prepared are you? Um, one of the things that you and I have talked about was if you were if you had an IT plan to uh, that was already cloudy. Right. All you did was accelerate it, right? The IT yeah. guy could go in the office, but they were in their pajamas in their living room, and you can keep accelerating mailboxes. But if you didn't. And all of a sudden, you're standing stuff up. That attack surface just gets really, really precarious. Um, I, I will confess, I did a I did a boot camp for IaaS infrastructure um, as part of quarantine because had a, all these extra cycles, and it was pretty easy to stand up servers in a cloud. Um, it was kind of difficult to figure out the networking pieces of it, and I found myself exposing VMs open to star dot star dot star. Just so I can get them running again, I can imagine some uh, some organizations having doing that same thing, and all of a sudden, you are now a ransomware target. Absolutely, and and I think the other thing is re remember that uh, some of the backup and recovery admins themselves were not able to go back into their data centers, or so having right. a tool in place, if you had a tool in place already that allows you to remotely manage and control and perform a bunch of operations, uh, it really helps. Having a lot of cloud-based apps can really help. And the mm -hmm. other thing that's happened is 
and I think it was Microsoft CEO who said that, but digital transformation has really accelerated. Uh, you Absolutely. Know, data is the business or data supplements the business. That's part of some research we did recently as well. And what we've seen is, well, obviously uh, this is uh, uh, an event that is making things uh, really go a little faster. And of course, when you go fast and you accelerate, uh, it may have consequences if you're not right. It's not so we talk a lot about, you know, the reasons to go to cloud would be to extend, especially for all those remote workers and, you know, not having to worry about VPNs into the data center. Why not just expose them straight to the cloud? But um, uh, you actually have some data from one of your more recent reports talking about infrastructure and security and some of the precariousness that comes from that. Um, can you walk us through that as well? Sure. Yeah. So let's take a look. And here, what we did is we uh, uh, asked, you know, uh, IT executives, and that's where you see the little icon at the top right in our COVID-19 survey. Uh, we talked to uh, knowledge workers and IT executives. So this is the IT exec's view of, you know, some of the challenges that really came up with having all of these remote workers. And if I take the top three, so multiple answers were allowed here. And if you take the top three, what do you see? Well, the online collaboration platforms that makes perfect sense and the Zooms, the, uh, the, the, the other tools that are used uh, uh, out there. But of course, the one thing that came up was the bandwidth and not surprisingly, cybersecurity. So for me, the big news or the important news, and I'm seeing this more and more, is cyber is becoming more and more the top two, top three, if not the top one answer when people talk about challenges, especially in the context of either recoverability, uh, even uh, the ability to, to here in this case, uh, support remote employees. Um, I think it really speaks for uh, what we've we've seen. The other thing, though, is at the same time that we're seeing this increased set of attacks and complexities, there is a skill set, um, really lack of skill set across the board uh, around cybersecurity. It's something we've seen in our IT spending intentions uh, year after year. So you've got the, the perfect storm almost brewing here where you have more attacks, more exposures, and you don't have all the skill sets you need for cyber. And by the way, you don't have all the skill sets you need for data protection either. It's uh, definitely one of the areas where IT is lacking some, uh, some skill sets. So there's a tremendous opportunity, I think, for uh, partners, uh, especially Veeam's channel partners to help. Yeah, yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, the skill sets necessary to protect next generation cloud based platforms don't really rely that much on what you know about data protection from the last um, a, a generation of stuff, right? So, Christoph, I remember when virtualization first came out and everyone was thinking just traditional IT pro, traditional backup, and they didn't know how to back up VMs, right? It was a different set of plumbing. Right. Exactly. Uh, and that was 12 years ago. And now here we are with, you know, the way that you back up IaaS is different than the way that you back up SaaS is different than whatever you know about backing up on-prem. Now, little theme pitch here. So we do have tools for each and every one of those. So, and the user experience is relatively common, but, um, but there are some different terms and some different taxonomies to think about from that. I, absolutely, and uh, we could also, although I won't cover it quite yet, uh, but uh, we could also talk about containers, uh, which of course is tied to the uh, all of the above, uh, because as you know, it's a very cloudy and, and sort of hybrid set of technologies. So exactly, and, and this is a new breed of challenges. And now, of course, there are differences, uh, even if you understand them, even if you apply all the right methodologies, the bigger question becomes, no, I'm in a hybrid world, like it or not, yep. I would probably have some stuff on-prem in uh, infrastructure as a service. I would be using some SaaS tools, especially today. How do I get to that coherence of SLAs? And I think that's really right. an interesting question. Uh, you can't really have one. It's going to be, you know, the weakest link type of, uh, of scenario. And it's something that I believe is, if you look at what people really want to get to, the, 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 you know, the stringent SLAs we see across the board are such that you really have to really check uh, and test every part of your topology in your organization. Uh, and there are challenges, I think, with cloud. So opportunities, great tool. But sure. also a challenge, just like virtualization, great technology to use in BCDR. Mm -hmm. and, but yeah, you're, you're right. You also have to protect it. Uh, and that was a, a challenge a few years ago, certainly not anymore. Yeah. You know, when I talk to CIOs, one of the things that I often will, will preach to them on, I will, I, if, if I could, I would, I would actually grab them by the shoulders and say, please do not go from well-protected and well-governed and, and compliant infrastructure 
to the unknown and be less protected. It's great that you want to modernize production, but you have to ensure a consistency of protection as well because the, you know, the mailbox that was on-prem last month um, is now standing up in Office 365 next month. And just because you went to a service does not change your responsibilities for retention and previous versions and role-based access, et cetera. Hey, we're going to bring up the map one last time. It's 25 past. I want to um, give a shout out to Morocco, to uh, New Jersey's in the house. Thank you. Colombia um, almost always joins as well. So love what's going on down there. Nairobi, Kenya. Um, that might be the first time. Um, that um, that I've uh, we've had uh, uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and then Switzerland uh, is always in the house uh, as well. So thank you for joining uh, as well. Um, let's see. So uh, we do also. Uh, Shoaib has a question around steps to, um, for privacy has been compromised, and someone's using a VPN to do it. Any way to find out who's messed up? Um, I am not the right guy for that. I don't want to let the question be unanswered. Um, but uh, but my colleague Rick Vanover has forgotten more about cybersecurity as it relates to data protection um, than I've ever learned. Um, so um, so we will make sure to answer that through the LinkedIn feed uh, as opposed to live. But really, thank you for answering the question, asking the question, and we'll come back from there. Um, okay, so let's, uh, we want to wrap up a little bit of time and I want to give you a chance to do the last word. But before we do that, I do want to, we've talked a lot about where cybersecurity is, is, is rife and a, a requirement for us to be investing in. We talked about how telework is there as well, but you actually have some data on in this, I hate the term new normal, um, that we live in, you know, in a, in a post COVID or current COVID scenario, how is that affecting it spending? That's one of the hallmark ESG reports that I, uh, I love to look at. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So what we did is we, uh, sort of refreshed our it spending intentions, uh, report, uh, in the context of the COVID and as part of this COVID specific research. And we lo we're looking at the spending impact by technology. And we asked uh, IT executives to tell us whether they were going to be spending more, uh, the same, or less, right? Now, across the board, uh, there is a decrease of about 2.2% in these sort of 100 plus size organizations. I believe that's what we computed about 2.5. So it's not good, okay? But it's not the end of the world. And But not every technology is uh, treated exactly the same in terms of where the money uh, or the spending will decrease. Now, in terms of data protection, uh, uh, and and you can see here uh, this is the one of the organ one of the areas that's going to see the least reduction as a matter of fact 26% are going to increase more to increase or augment their spend and not surprisingly what do you see well remote telework in second position and in first position guess what cyber so sure. you really have the uh, i think if anything, it just confirms uh, what we were just discussing. Uh, and I think this is significant uh, because, again, out of every investment, uh, every investment in IT is an opportunity to improve. And what I'm seeing here is uh, IT executives in uh, the, the, the in, you know, dealing with this situation are actually spending more in some areas. And clearly, we know from, from other research that it is to improve and, uh, and get uh, to be more operationally efficient. So that's that's all very good in my opinion. It's again yeah. out of a bad thing, you know. You try to get a good thing. Sure. You know, um, uh, I think that I think ESG's IT spending intentions report is 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 easily one of their most definable and insightful reports that ESG produced. I remember reading it back when I was at Microsoft before my time at ESG, and then certainly coming out afterwards. One of the things that always surprised me um, in that report, and it's actually true in this year's version as well. It bothered me when I first saw that things like cybersecurity and data protection were always at the top. And why wasn't it virtualization? Why wasn't it databases? Why wasn't it production stuff? And and I remember uh, I remember Duplessy and uh, and Tony Prigmore explaining to me when the data first came out. I was like, well, every time that you update some part of your production infrastructure, you got to secure it. You got to back it up. And so you put a little bit of backup over here, and you put a little bit of security over here, and every workload you do does that. And when you add all that up, turns out you spent more on cyber and, and data backup than you did on the production workload itself. But it always was interesting to me to see how the protection of data almost always requires a higher level investment because of the incremental uh, that you do for each of the production workloads that you're evolving on. I always found that to be um, intriguing. Okay, we have one minute left. And I want to give you the last word. 
So um, what's that one last pearl of wisdom that you would share with, uh, with the uh, decision makers and the executives on today's call? Well, it would be very simple. Uh, know your metrics, not just your objectives, but your actuals, and uh, seek coherence of our POs and RTOs across platforms. That's really the main thing. Uh, that's the best thing you can do for your organization. That's what puts you in the best position to recover in a way that is predictable and meets your business objectives because data is the business. And what gets measured matters. All right. Thank you so much, Christoph. Thank you for joining us. For everyone watching today, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Take care. Thank you.